So next we have shifting gears, taking things on more of a practical uh, level. Uh, so from kindling self-awareness, we're shifting to actions of virtue. And so we have two uh, heavyweights. The first is Ahmed Ashkar. And uh, many of you may have uh, met him when he uh, honored us at the uh, donor's reception that we held earlier this year. Uh, and uh, I do want to th uh, thank Ahmed. Uh, he's a very busy man. If you had a chance to talk with him, uh, and if you haven't, you should. But he's all over the place. And so to tag him down to Beckley, West Virginia, uh, so thank you so much. Uh, he just finished up with the Clinton Global Initiative uh, uh, sessions uh, happening. Did it, it's completely uh, done. And so uh, right away finished there, and now he's here, and then he's off somewhere else. And so uh, Ahmed uh, is the CEO of Halt Prize uh, Foundation. And this is awarded at the CGI. It's a million dollar prize to social entrepreneurs who have an idea that is both business uh, value, but also philanthropic value, value correct? And, uh, and so in that sense, Bill Clinton and Time Magazine consider this whole notion as one of the five ideas that are changing the world. Um, he's obviously been part of the CGI uh, network and has been uh, on different media outlets, given multiple interviews. Uh, one of the things that, that is admirable that he does is uh, in Palestine, uh, he's a, not only an independent advisor, but he has uh, founded the Palestine Water Company, uh, and uh, which is, again, all about giving uh, back. Uh, and so uh, that is our first, uh, I'd say, panelist of sorts. And uh, assisting him is, uh, we have another heavyweight, uh, Dr. Ahmed Hashim. He is in the NGO space, and he brings some real-world examples to light. Uh, he is currently uh, uh, heading bi Boston Biopharma, correct? And uh, he's involved in many of the ex-Soviet uh, nations, and he's obviously worked with uh, WHO, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and so the comp so we have really very valuable assets, and they'll give you their insights, but more importantly, you want to talk to them afterwards to see how, if you have ideas, how they can be brought forward. So with that, Ahmed, where's your uh, video? Yeah, put it up. No, uh, oh, no, I'm going to use the mic. I'm going to use the mic. I'm going to use the handheld. Guys, uh, assalamu alaikum. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Trud, uh, Ali, uh, for having us here. Uh, we're going to start off with a video to kind of put things in perspective, and then uh, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll light it up in here, and I'll, I'll be able to stay uh, till about uh, three, th till after uh, the, the keynote today to discuss. <laughs> The Clinton Global Initiative and the Holt International Business School have come together to create the world's largest network of social entrepreneurs through the Holt Prize. It's my belief that there are not enough disruptive and innovative companies servicing the world's poorest. <laughs> We're challenging students from around the world to come up with innovative and disruptive companies that can really change the trajectory of social challenges everywhere. The more opportunities that entrepreneurs have, the better off society is going to be. One of the things that differentiates Hall Prize from any other initiative in the world is our ability, through President Clinton's viewpoint, to cast a huge magnifying glass on, on social issues. The time for discussions and ideas has passed. We must act. These are problems that define whether we have a future or not. And I think the Halt Prize has come in at a critical time to focus young minds on the right things that makes a difference in this world, that's disruptive, that helps us change the way we think about the future. I believe Mpani is the next big innovation in development financing for our members. We have recognized the economic value of this huge segment to corporates and provided them a path to actually achieve their business ends by making a difference. I truly think that the Holt Prize has the potential to become the Nobel Prize for change. How do I develop products and services that have a positive net impact on society with every next product, good, or service that's sold? That's the future of business. This is an engine for social change. This is a machine 
that has the capacity to churn out and support and really uh, inspire and mentor new social entrepreneurs. It is Aspire's vision to train and empower farmers in peri-urban and rural areas where insects are already consumed to be able to farm their own insects so that they can feed their own families and at the same time have an opportunity to increase their income. Through the HALT Prize and the platform of the HALT Prize, we've been able to catapult this desire, this ambition, into a legitimate, established global business. And what it has done is not simply launch another business or even another great startup. It's the launch of an entire industry that is poised to rapidly scale around the world and effect long-lasting change that will have significant impact on the lives of millions of people. The world's social problems are not getting better. Social entrepreneurship definitely is a response to the world putting humanity up against the wall. So how do we as human beings respond? I imagine a world where there's no differentiation between social and business. Where doing good and doing well are things that we just do because it's the right thing. We are the next wave of social entrepreneurs. Good. Thanks. I, it's a little long, but it does a lot more so we can keep, keep time. Um, uh, thanks for watching that. What I'm going to do today is just give you a quick, no more than 12 minutes on, how's the sound? It's okay. 12 minutes on um, social entrepreneurship, why it's important, why it's a problem today that the world's um, uh, urban slums are, are, are getting larger, and what it, what's the economic impact on, on all of us. And then we'll turn it over to uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Ahmed, to talk to you a little bit about more, more practical NGO approaches, and then we'll have a discussion around the segues between the traditional approaches and, and the new wave approaches. So um, first, I want to start with a little exercise. Um, most of you see a picture, and I want you to Ask yourself, what's wrong with this picture? And maybe somebody tell me, what's wrong, what's wrong with this picture? Upside down, right? Everybody agrees that it's upside down, right? Most people do. So the camera needs to be turned the other way to fix it. There's an alternative approach. Anybody know what it is? Staying on your heads is one thing. Good? It's, we're, we're, we're warming up. This, guy's in, it, this guy is in, in an outer space. He's in, he's in a rocket ship. Okay, he's at the International Space Station. And this was a live interview that was done where the crowd starts murmuring, hey, guys, fix the camera, fix the camera. And this is all about changing paradigms, changing perspectives. This guy just can do a somersault because he's on zero gravity and turn around. Right? So sometimes we think the solutions are, are in front of us when the reality is we have to shift entire perspectives to find what the right ideas are to move forward. And that's the idea that I hope to share with you. And the actionable items we want you to leave with is to A, think differently, B, be inspired to, to have change. The impact can be as little as somebody leaving from this room with an idea. And of course, third, understanding the effects of not only our Muslim community, but the global community on social issues that exist worldwide and why we have to really define and cut that border of you know charity and, and business. It needs to be one and the same where every time I, I said in the video, I sell a good product or service, uh, there's that top line revenue that is just moving into the, into the space. Um, so again, why is the urban slum issue, um, why is it even existing? There's currently 1.2 to 1.3 billion people living in urban slums. Why do people move to urban slums? Well, they're moving from rural to the city in chase of the dream of economic prosperity, shared opportunity. They see, hear stories, transportation is becoming more and more unavailable, so they're able now to get to the cities. The reality is they get to the cities, and this is in Mumbai. We, we took this footage, we go down every year to where our projects are, and, and we try to do documentaries on our, our companies, and um, they, they get stuck. There's, they don't find jobs. Uh, this kind of dream that they thought they were going to achieve by coming to infill and, and urban uh, disappears, and they move into these informal settlements where incomes range from you know anywhere from zero, uh, but primarily a dollar or two a day up to maybe five dollars a day of income. Um, and again, these communities are going to double in size 
over the next 15 years. By 2030, two and a half billion people will live in urban slums around the world. And again, if this community is not participating in economic prosperity, they become a drain on society, which ends up costing everybody uh, in the long run. Why is it important to, oh, my slides are a little, see what happens when you use Mac in a, uh, in a, in a world that, that doesn't have a hashtag? <laughs> um, so I'll take you through this. Why is it important that we invest in things? And I'm just going to use an example uh, of, of Perry and, and, and Perry urban areas. It's because there's a return on investment that comes back to, the, to everyone else. So in, in, or if you look at early education as just an example, every dollar invested basically saves that economy $7. And you can go further. There's new studies now that talk about the word gap. And if you can catch uh, children early enough, every dollar invested will produce 17, up to $17 return, right? So there's lots of reasons why we should care about the next generation. And this session topic is the next decade of social entrepreneurship. And I've kind of, you can't really read that because those slides, but why is it important? It saves the government money. People say, oh, how can we find funding solutions? Well, the reality is if, if there's no new ideas and new companies, governments bear the responsibility, whether they're doing it or not, to take care of its people and provide the social benefits to their people. If the private sector can do it at a more affordable cost, though there's savings there that the government is even willing to share with you as an entrepreneur to get those objectives done. The UK's done it with their uh, prison reform system, where now the UK is looking to actually outsource prison reform and prison management to the private sector, because private sector is historically much better at doing things than the public sector. Um, there's money servicing the poor. Guys, at two to five dollars a day of, of income, right, for these people, that means two to five dollars a day in spend, because they definitely don't save any money. So imagine, at two and a half billion people at $2 a day. Just look at the low end of it, right? You've got fi a $5 billion, okay, a day market segment, which nobody is going after, literally. So even from a commercial basis, it's, it, I, people say, the future of social is business. Everybody says that. I say the future of business is social because it's just such, it's, it's such an opportunity to be able to go in there and provide basic needs and services. And then, of course, um, economic return uh, that I talked about in the above example, where it just, again, it makes sense. It's, it saves money. Um, what is social entrepreneurship? And again, this whole prize definitions, so open for a deliberation discussion. But for us, on the vertical axis, you just have the cost of a social service, clean water, health care, access to education, you name your pick. And on the horizontal axis, you have the total number of people that that service is reaching. So literally, a social enterprise, as we define it, the cost to deliver the product continuously goes down to, until it reaches zero. And then the next, the very next sale, you basically will generate a profit right here, at whatever, whatever that intersection is. So that's how most, most of you say, well, this is, this is basic. But it's not basic in the development world. In the development world, it says feed a child one child for a dollar, feed 10 children for $10, feed 1,000 for $1,000. The cost to bring the critical mass down never decreases. But if you design models which can actually decrease and have diminishing cost, you eventually will always get to where not only does it free, but there's actually profit being made. Now there's an argument what should happen with that profit. Professor Yunus says that profit should always be dumped back into the business. You know, some of our entrepreneurs say, well, we're not giving up a career in banking uh, to go into the sector for no reason. We're going to extract that profit and distribute it to our shareholders. But it doesn't matter because the reality is, is the products are getting cheaper. Services are getting cheaper. Okay? So that's another, you know, if you're taking notes, a good d a discussion point. Um, some of our, um, sorry, the formatting is, I should PDF. Um, this is uh, uh, Akanksha Hazari. She won our Hope Prize a few years ago. Today, she runs the world's largest slum-based loyalty and rewards program. And our previous speaker mentioned insights. But do you guys really know what an insight is? Anyone? One, I want to take w one guess. Define for me an insight. Come on. Yeah, that's good. Realization of something very obvious. Insights are fundamental for any breakthrough. And I'm going to give you a definition that you'll remember for the rest of your life. 
Okay? The first is something, right, that is keeping you up at night. You keep thinking about. For whatever reason, it happened, you experienced it, you read it, you were at this program, and, and you, you can't, it keeps you up, you can't even sleep because it's that good, right? The second is you want to tell all your friends about it, right? Something that not only is it that good, right, but it's not embarrassing enough to have to keep to yourself, right? It's so powerful that you want to share it with every next person you meet. It might have already happened to you since being here. You meet somebody, he says something, she says something, you begin thinking, and it just, it won't leave the, you know, that, that, that frontal lobe, and you want to keep discussing it and telling everybody you see about it. Very simple. Those insights can be used to build disruptive businesses. Akanksha's insight when she built Empani was that, wait a second, there's expenditure happening in these peri and peri-urban societies. There's money being spent, right? And these people have the same needs that we have in the West. You know, they want to use beauty shampoos. They want to have the nicest food. They want to have the best education. Right? So why aren't there loyalty and rewards programs built around this sector? But rather than getting airline points and airline miles, she's using these rewards for things like clean water and education. So she's built a loyalty program that allows people in the urban slum to get access to critical resources without doing anything more than the things they're doing already. That model incentivizes, now she's got a partnership with Vodafone, Every time one of her customers uses Vodafone to top up their line, they get a credit back that they can use for clean water. They can get a credit back that they can use for education. So she didn't even shift anything. She's making money. The companies that she brings in and creates loyalty schemes are making money because now they have access and loyalty with this huge customer segment. And of course, the benefactor is getting the critical social needs that they need. So that's one example. That's, that's outside of Mumbai. Um, the second, and I, I saw some people cringe during the video, this is our startup Aspire food group. They're literally, they're, they're, it's a microworks insect farming model. So they have created a business, and their insight was, I can't believe one in three people in the world already eat insects. They're like, wow. Then the second insight was, I can't believe there's no supply chain that fulfills this production so that people that need this critical resource for, for sustenance have the ability to tap into it on not a seasonal basis because prior to their company, there was no other company that had an entire supply chain, right? Then they basically came up with a microworks model that layered this demand and created farming kits where people in low income areas could actually farm their own insects. And you guys are all, you know, kind of cringing, but here's the reality. We're about to enter a deal with the largest chicken feed manufacturer in Latin America out of Guatemala. Uh, some of you know Pollo Campero. Uh, the Pollo Campero brand and us will go into a deal where we'll begin supplying them with chicken feed. About 70 to 80% of the cost of a chicken is in the food that it eats. So if you're paying $5 now, we can bring that cost of that chicken down to where it's a dollar, okay? Again, by re substituting God knows what in the feed with, with, with an insect byproduct, which comes from a combination of crickets, grasshoppers, and, and these, uh, and it sounds kind of crazy. Um, okay, and um, that, that, that's, that's all I want to kind of stimulate for you guys right now, uh, keeping it good in time so you have lots of conversational time, etc. But I, I think I'll leave you with, you know, uh, don't, and uh, the first example, don't allow the existing barriers in your mind on what's possible to limit you on what can be done. And have those conversations and, and let them germinate. And, and don't, the, again, people ask me all the time, why is it young people that you go after? And I say, well, young people haven't been, um, you know, they, they, they haven't been influenced by society, by norms, which tell us this is impossible. So we can make the impossible possible. It's a reality. I think our keynote speaker later today is going to share with you more on how that's real. But I'm going to turn it over to Ahmed to come in and talk a little bit more about the, some of the development, uh, what the NGO world is doing, and, and what he's doing to uh, build the next decade. So, Thank you very much, Ahmed. Thank you, Ahmed, and thank you, everyone, for, for having me. Uh, what I will do today is... I will share with you four lessons or four insights building on Marilyn's earlier uh, presentation. Four insights that I learned from working in development. 
Um, my background has been always in healthcare. I studied medicine, and then after that, I did a PhD in healthcare informatics, so it's also healthcare. And then after that, I worked with Microsoft as the head of their uh, healthcare and life sciences division, so it's also healthcare. And my work in development took that hat in perspective. And one of the first lessons that I learned is if you really want to do development, you need to take into account not just your background, not just healthcare, for example, in my case, but it has to be a holistic point of view. You have to take into account jobs. Uh, you have to take into account even the roads. This is an example uh, that I worked on. This is a village in northeastern Syria. This is among the poorest villages in the country. Uh, that was part of a project sponsored by the United Nations Development Program to, to improve the health care of these poor villages. And one of the first things that we re I realized, and that was also um, appropriately, appropriately addressed, is if you want to improve health care, there is no way you can do it without improving the job situation. There is no way you can do it without improving even the road to the village. This is pretty much the village. Look, this is where they live. And there is, it's hard to even get access to the poorest, to the closest city. Uh, one of the most important indicators for whether a child will die within the first five years of age of their life is whether their mother is educated or not. This is the single most important factor. So how can you improve child mortality without improving the education of the women? Similarly, the main reason why people in villages become below poverty line is because of a healthcare problem. If the main uh, breadwinner earner gets some kind of sickness, then that is the most important factor to make to make them below the poverty line. So how can you improve poverty without taking care of health care and vice versa? So the first insight is you really have to take into account the whole thing and development. I'm, I'm not belittling, of course, development uh, was one particular aspect, but to do it properly, you need to take into account the whole thing. Uh, this is just to give you a flavor of, of the village and the people there. Um, one thing I learned also is if you want to do a quick test of whether this is a really poor village or not, just look at what they wear in their feet. Uh, these are all barefooted. This is the level of poverty. Uh, this, is, this is a student. I'm sorry, this is a student. This is a worker, barefooted. This student goes two hours to the school every single day and two hours back, and then he decided that he cannot do it. That's why he because he's so interested in education. He actually left his family. He s slept at a warehouse very close to his school to save his trip two hours back and forth. Again, the first idea is you need to take into account the full, the full developmental approach. Second idea I would like to mention is involving stakeholders, which is what, what I learned also relatively quickly being out there in the field you have to involve the stakeholders, and they ha there has to be some uh, skin in the game for them as well. Don't just give them money, don't, th don't just give them a healthcare center. This is a healthcare center in that poor village. It was built by the government. Uh, this is their lab, I guess. Uh, this is the main exam room. And this is a center that sees real patients. By comparison, uh, this is the school. So by comparison, we asked people in, within the village, do you really care about schools? Do you really care about health? Their answer is yes. So we told them, if you really care, then you need to help us build the facility. You need to help us guard the facility. You need to help us keep it in, in, in shape. And you need to organize some shifts among yourselves. And unless you do that, we're not gonna be able to help you. That made a difference. Um, and you can do that by listening to them. So we held several sessions listening to them. What are their concerns? But then after, after listening, you need to come back 
And here we were lecturing them and giving them the hard facts that, okay, you care about healthcare, you know what, that's what you need to do. And it's like this social contract, uh, or that's what I will call it, that I think makes a big difference. So second point, again, involving the stakeholders. There is a challenge, so I just want you to be aware. This is an example from the Syrian Organization for the Disabled. Involving the stakeholders is not always easy because sometimes stakeholders are so powerless. So they don't have a say, they cannot be engaged. The example I will give is this is a child that is uh, disabled, uh, he needs sessions for, uh, he, he has hearing disability, and he needs sessions to help him with speech therapy. And these sessions, they need to be approximately 20 sessions. This is the full course. Uh, this is a nonprofit organization that I was on the board of. And like any nonprofit, resources are limited. So we have space or we have, within our capacity, we can accommodate up to 200 sessions per week. And you need to make sure that these sessions are utilized as efficiently as possible, meaning if a patient like this <clears throat> is scheduled and doesn't show up, then you have wasted a session and you already don't have a whole lot of resources to waste. So. One thing we, we, add, we required is if there is a session that is scheduled and the patient does not show up, then we will take them out from this treatment program. But we've, we realized after that is this is not the fault of the patient. If their parents are negligent or maybe too swamped with their life because they have so many other things to worry about and I respect that, why do we punish the poor child for what their parents are doing? And this is an ethical dilemma that I still haven't quite uh, figured out. To be honest with you, eventually we, we continued with this punishment, but I feel bad about it because we are punishing the people that do not deserve to be punished. And I'm not saying punishment in the strict sense of the word, but this is effectively what's happening. Basically, we have very, very limited resources and we want to make sure they are utilized and whenever there are sessions that, for which the patients do not show up, then this is wasted resource, so I might as well use it with the resources that will actually benefit, with the patients that will benefit from it. Okay, third point that I would like to make is on the use of technology. Uh, I worked with Microsoft, so I'm obsessed with technology. And this is in a village in Ethiopia that we visited as part of a mission with the Bill Gates Foundation to look at the healthcare center there. Uh, for me, as a Microsoft guy, this is like, okay, all of these papers, immediately computers, and that will solve the problem. But at a closer look, this is a poor village, very remote area. They don't have electricity most of the time. It comes and goes. Uh, they didn't have printing paper for the printer. So <clears throat> what made the difference to me is I noticed sitting there, when a patient comes, there is a clerk that works and she can pull up, the, these are all the patient charts. She can pull up the patient chart within like less than eight seconds. And I felt, okay, eight seconds. Maybe even the best Microsoft technology will not be as fast. And it, and it works all the time, whether there is electricity or not, and you don't need a network administrator. So, okay, why, why do we bother? Of course, this has limitations. Uh, it doesn't generate statistics as quickly as a computer. So what we did is we kept this exactly as is, but we just added another computer for statistics where they do some basic data entry to, just to generate these reports. Uh, this picture that I showed here, this is with a senior executive from the Gates Foundation. He took a picture, this is a picture of a TV that is locked within that healthcare center. Of course, a lot of money was donated to equip the healthcare center with this TV so that it does patient education, but what it does is exactly this. It's locked and it collects dust, uh, rust. So the, the third point that I wanna mention and that I learned from the field, the appropriate use of technology. Paper, pen and paper is an excellent piece of technology 
within some certain contexts. So don't rush to automate. It's not always a good idea. Coming from a guy who was obsessed with automation. Last point is, and building on Ahmed's excellent presentation, I feel that the borders and the boundaries between for-profit and non-profit are blurred and I'm okay with that. I admit at some point I felt, well, no, for-profit should be just for-profit, non-profit should be non-profit, non government should be government. Now, at least to me, I, I feel it's okay to, to mix it, all of these. <clears throat> so I'm now currently working on a project. It's a for-profit project um, as part of a company that I co-founded called Boston Biopharma. We are bringing US technology for profit to Africa to help them produce locally pharmaceuticals that they need at a low cost, high quality. Uh, the project, as I said, is for profit. It was very well studied by a PhD at Harvard Business School. He did all the business case and the numbers add up and we're there to make profit. But by also making the profit, we are supplying Africa with medications that they need, low cost, high quality. In addition, these are medications for cancer, by the way. <clears throat> In addition, uh, we're not viewing it as only to provide these products, sell them, make profit, but also to look at a holistic development approach. So even though we are focusing on cancer, uh, cancer medications, we have plans that are now ongoing. This is a new project. Um, it's only like a few months old, but we have plans now to develop a cancer registry to have a database with, to provide accurate information about cancer. We have uh, in another initiative to develop uh, screening programs because currently, um, unfortunately, patients, this is in the country of Algeria and we have plans for other countries. Uh, people wait in, in waiting uh, lists for several years sometimes to get their turn to treatment for cancer. Cancer, imagine what happens. So we're developing also programs for screening and triaging. Um, we are developing programs to train nurses, um, between joint programs between the US and, and that country, especially, especially nurses on caring for cancer patients because as uh, doctors here know, <coughs> nurses are pretty much the main uh, cornerstone of the healthcare system. And if you improve that, that in my view is the single most important thing to improve the healthcare system. Uh, with all due respect to all the physicians in, in, he, he, in here, um, and I, I also studied uh, as a physician, but nurses are more important with all due respect. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so with this, I would like to conclude and just remind you, this is an, another example of what we're doing there where, again, we're involving several stakeholders. Um, I would like just to end that even if we're working w within a for-profit world, let's not forget the non-profit, the development activities associated with it. And this has several benefits. One of them, of course, is that the altruistic side in all of us, which is very important. But in addition, it also has benefits to corporate social responsibility. One of them is we're living now in a small world and if there is tremendous poverty in some neighborhoods and some countries, this will typically generate anger, which typically will create all kinds of crime and terrorism and I don't know what. Not to mention other poor communities generally have poor health and in today's world, we're all interconnected and Ebola in one corner of the world will affect the rest of us. So doing this type of development has both uh, has benefits to the altruistic side, but also to the other side as well in, in all of us. And it's, it behooves all of us to keep that in mind. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I think now we'll just open it up for Q&A. It was a, gr a okay. great, great presentation. And I think one point to what you're saying, I mean, I read a report if you took a couple percentage points of the profits made just from the US 
exchanges, the NASDAQ and the, and the New York Stock Exchange, you could actually pay for and buy the solution to every single social challenge that exists, right? Entrepreneurs are greedy. We live in a world that's capitalistic, right? Let's make chasing social issues entrepreneurial, right? Let the entrepreneurs right. figure it out and you'll be surprised at the results that'll happen. So um, Absolutely. Who wants the, you can direct questions at either one of us. If you don't have a preference, we'll just take them in alternate order. <laughs> uh, so my, my question was about, I, I, you know, at, at the end of your talk, you were talking about how they're looking at oncology and providing cancer medication. And, you know, I know, I guess Emma the Shikara can, you know, uh, you know um, chime in as well. But, you know, when you're talking about providing cancer care in, in the developing world, that is a hugely, you know, that, 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 that's a huge task. For one thing, you know, in no way do they ever, can, they, can we even, even objectify uh, the way we're, 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 you know, conferring cancer care in those parts of the world vis-a-vis -vis what we do here. I mean, the aims and objectives of what we're trying to get to are never the same. In, uh, uh, um, in like Lahore in uh, Pakistan, there is this uh, Shokat Khanum cancer center that was made by one of the leading politicians there. And, and I, I've gone into that center and looked at that as well. But really, you know, I mean, what they're doing is that they're kind of charging some of, you know, the, the affording people to come in and, and they pay. And out of the revenue or whatever they're making there, they are kind of paying for some of the poorer people. But usually it's about a 70-30 split where, you know, 70% are affording, 30% are not. It really goes speak that, you know, cancer care is so expensive that, you know, without a good business model, and even that's not a good business model, it is very difficult to, you know, give, uh, you know, really re reliable care. So how are you guys going around that? What are, I mean, is it just by, by charity that you're affording this care, or is there some kind of a sustaining model that you guys are looking at where you can, you know, you, you can, you know, give cancer care to allow these patients who will never be able to afford it otherwise? No, I have to admit that the project that I describe here is a for-profit project. So we pre prepared the business plan, we shopped for investors, we secured the funding, and this is a project where the business model is very clear. You produce medications at a certain cost, you sell them for more than your cost, and you make profit. But the benefit is we can sell them high quality for approximately it varies by medication. It can be even up down to 10% of the equivalent that is imported. So you can treat 10 times more patients using the same budget than if you did not have such a local production. So, so these drugs are primarily the drugs that are off patent then? Correct. You're not obviously, I mean like, like in India, for example, you know what they did with you know, uh, serafinib and how they just decided to go ahead and do it and you know, the, 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 the Supreme Court gave them the go-ahead and even though it was Correct. potentially a violation. Correct. The, the, these are mostly off-path. The, the key here is that the Robin Hood model, take from the rich, give to the poor, is not sustainable yeah. because sometimes that funding runs out. If you look at the Clinton Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation gave uh, us money to actually take on some, a couple of diseases, et cetera. Right. And because we were looking at it from, a, even though it's a nonprofit, from a sustainable perspective, we were able to drive down the cost. So all of this is a cost game. And what for-profits are amazing at doing is figuring out how to get to efficiencies. And those are the efficiencies that allow not just a permanent stream, right, of vaccines to be available, but it continuously brings that cost down. And they're not selling at market. Charities buy at market from the Ex existing pharmaceuticals. Right. So literally having a pharmaceutical player in the sector does 100x the impact over the long run. I cannot tell you enough horror stories about how the big pharmaceutical companies are fighting projects like this because when, when they sell a medication for, for example, $1,000 and no exaggeration, and you offer it for $100, they will not be happy. Yeah, and actually, I'll, I'll chime in on that too. Sorry, it's a great point. We have a startup that um, came out this year with negative uh, wound pressure therapy, since there's a lot of doctors in here that makes sense. Uh, so basically, it's a wound pump that you put on uh, open, open wounds, and it's a dressing. And long story short, we brought the price down to $4 because it's manual versus $1,000. The first acquisition bid we got was from, uh, I will not name, was from a medical device company that wanted to buy our technology and kill it, 
right? Because it was too cheap, right? And, and this is the problem that, you're, that charity can never compete with, with that of a for-profit entity to drive costs down. And that's across sectors, healthcare, education, um, you know, and otherwise. I also would like to add that um, the lines and the boundaries are blurring between for-profit and not-for-profit. And my view, and I'm no naive, I mean, I've, I worked with Microsoft, I know the capitalistic uh, for-profit motivation of people. But at the same time, these global companies have the kind of reach that no other entity has. I went to very remote areas in, in Africa, in, in Ethiopia, for example, and everywhere you go, there are no roads to get there, but there is a sign for Coca-Cola. So, I mean, Coca-Cola is like all over the place. So maybe some partnership between uh, not-for-profit philanthropy and Coca-Cola to improve the situation of these villagers is not a bad thing. Um, my question is going to be about technology and specifically usage of cell phones. Like Marilyn said, um, most of the people actually have more cell phones than um, I mean toilets in the world. So, uh, Dr. Hashim, uh, since you have nurses um, taking care of you know patients uh, in third world countries, are you aware of any applications um, taking pictures uh, of the lesions or questionable uh, things that the patient has? Uh, sharing that with the first world world, first world um, physicians and getting a second opinion um, because I mean to my knowledge I worked on a couple of uh, iPhone apps uh, medical apps and uh, this is a really hot area uh, trying to get diagnosis in the areas that s uh, specialists are not available right um, I'm aware of several such applications and Harvard Medical School, for example, they have a service called, I think it's called Second Opinion, and, and there are others also. Okay. Um, and SAMS also offers this, uh, this here in American Medical Society, they offer it also in, in some geographies. So I'm aware of that, and I think they're good. In my view, though, their benefit is somewhat limited, in the sense, typically the problem there in these areas that need healthcare, staff, typically it's not the diagnosis. I mean, the diagnosis is important, I'm not underestimating it, but it's the full ecosystem of care for which diagnosis is only one side one, or one element. So yes, you can do diagnosis remotely and that, that's helpful, I'm not underestimating it, but then who will follow up after that? So uh, in which facility, what kind of equipment does it have? And I give some yeah. examples of a facility that I saw myself. So I think it's a little bit more complicated, and I mean, I'm, I don't mean to offend anyone, but I feel the second opinion through the internet is kind of, it's a little bit naive, simplistic in my view. Okay. It's, it's okay, it's, I, I'd like to keep it, but the problem is way more complicated than that. <laughs> Can we borrow your lapel? Yeah, <laughs> share that. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna support you in your, uh, Although uh, coming into this, we thought we would be on opposite sides of the of the fence. Look, you can't build technology and drop it into the urban slum. It doesn't work. You mentioned it in your last slide. How many water wells are broke within the first 12 months because the community is not engaged? They these are people. They don't. You don't just drop. Say, hey, here's an app. Text your pictures here, and you'll get met. It doesn't work that way. You have to get buy-in, and especially as you go more remote and rural. You're talking about villages with you know, formal structures in place, a village leader, and believe me, if, if he's not engaged or she's not engaged, you have no chance at adoption. And that's why the pay-to-play approach you know, works. People, again, the same way when somebody, you know, you all have kids maybe that are in college or that will be in college or you were that kid, right? When you pay, you perform better than when mom and dad flipped the bill, right? And again, uh, things are no different. So on the technology side or any startup, you really have to get the community's buy-in in the design and implementation. A small comment on this pay-to-play. Uh, this uh, Syrian organization for the disabled that I also saw a picture of. Um, we tried a model where we offered the, these sessions for free because everybody that we see in this facility is very poor and they need the help. When we offered it for free, 
people felt it has no value, so they didn't show up to these sessions. Because free, it means, well, I don't care. When we charged for it, an amount that is not very high, it's, in, it's within their means, they can, they can afford it. When we charged for it, they felt it's so important, it's so valuable, they're paying for it, so they will show up. for this brilliant work and transformation. I had the privilege of spending some time with uh, Muhammad Yunus and the whole Grameen Bank principal and you know your comment about um, mort child mortality is directly correlated with the education of the moms. And I'm just wondering how you're building women into your business models because it seems as though from an economic point of view, from a child welfare point of view, from many facets of society, uh, women seem to be taking a, a profound leadership role. And I'm just wondering how that plays into your models. Yeah, sure. I'll start. I think you have okay. So obviously women un, uh, you know, undoubtedly are the key to success in any social enterprise or development. Um, you know, mothers run households. Uh, they're charged with uh, earning income as well on the side. Uh, and you, out of Grameen's initial loans, 95% were made to women. Um, so let's, let's be real. There's also a lot of issues around uh, savings and, and men. Men are notorious for coming back home uh, taking that money that that mom has made, spending it on things that you know the, the you know I don't know how to say it nicely, but you know on on you know drinks and 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 women and partying and I mean again, people in the in the urban slums live, they have the same wants, expectations, recreation uh, as we do, and moms like moms everywhere just want to see their kids prosper, and that's why you have to build them into the solution. And every one of our startups that come through Hall Prize, if there's not a solution uh, that integrates uh, women and girls into the model, then we'll immediately throw it out because it won't be successful. So it's, it's integral. I would also add that it's important not just to integrate women, but to integrate men. Because one side, negative side effect to empowering women is increased divorce rates, which we probably don't want to do um, because the men would feel more threatened when the women are more Seriously. powerful. So uh, to integrate women, I guess we need to integrate the full family. We need to educate everybody and not just the women. Men, I would say men are, are more important to be, to be educated in that sense and not to feel threatened and, and to get some buy-in from them. <laughs> I don't know about more important, but um, <laughs> look, uh, there's definitely in our, in our, we've got a company that um, has manufactured a 100% xylitol gum, which is used to, again, a lot of medical people. Uh, it reduces oral disease and tooth decay, and they're promoting gum use. And it's literally this, this and we're, we've, we started just using moms to sell the gum, and then the moms were making a little bit of income, and then the dad started feeling a little bit less inferior, and you do not want to create that scenario as well. And again, that's no different than here in the West. I mean, you know, a lot of times the higher earner is uh, taking a little bit of grief from the other. I mean, you know, so again, in I think that the the next uh, this topic is the next wave or the next generation of social entrepreneurship. You know, build businesses from a sociological perspective the same way you would build them uh, here in the West, uh, and even focus more so holistically. Uh, but definitely have a role for, for women. Um, I have a question. Uh, thank you uh, for sharing the information and the projects um, that you're, uh, you're doing. Um, I just had some ideas. I don't know if they're well formed yet, but what I was thinking was uh, when it comes to social um, entrepreneurship, um, you know, you're in, a, in an organization that uh, uh, is uh, intellectuals, they're intellectuals, there's good um, monitoring of that, but if you spread the idea, do you fear that um, people might think too hard about the entrepreneurship aspect and the social aspect is just fluff to sell the idea and make it sound good so that the, the projects that are being done are more predatory over the people in the slums, like a, like a slum lord kind of situation, creating that situation? H how would you monitor other projects that start developing over time? Do you fear that it will get warped over time? Yeah, I, I personally, uh, there is that risk, but there's also a lot of misconceptions around slumlords. Slumlords are charging 50, 60, 70% in loans so that people can have access to a toilet and the decency to a, uh, running water, et cetera, right? So when these companies go in 
and they're charging 7%, say, you know, water.org does a water credit program. You know, yes, there, there's a rate of return, but it's still less. And for me, and again, my opinion is going to be different than a lot of people's, but we don't actually, like, if your intention is completely profit, but you've developed, you know, I don't know if I have my slide, but if you've developed a, a diminishing uh, cost model, I, I don't care. Because at the end of the day, you're driving down the cost. Now, what happens is perfect markets. When entrepreneurs are all attacking a, a, a marketplace, the cost will naturally decline because of competition, right? So a, as you gain momentum, you don't have to worry about um, you know, one guy, a company using social, one guy being motivated by business. What you end up having is more competition, and competition will breed that perfect marketplace. Does that make sense? comment to add to from my experience to do uh, corporate social responsibility to do it well you need the real commitment from the board of directors of the company you don't need just like the executive team or somebody f not even the, the CEO of the company I think you need the full commitment from the board and unless they see it as a priority, it will not get, go very far. Um, in addition, from my experience, to do corporate social responsibility properly, usually for-profit companies are better at cutting a check than at the hard work of understanding the real needs of communities and designing programs of, for intervention and improving to improve the, the situation, which means a partnership between a for-profit and a not-for-profit, in my view, is the, the perfect model, if it can be worked out. Um, so uh, the second point uh, that, you've, uh, that you made is uh, be inspired. And the third point that you made uh, is to uh, uh, take use of, take advantage or take use of the uh, uh, technology appropriately. Uh, and Marilyn earlier, she mentioned uh, epiphany and transformation. So she gave an example of somebody having an epiphany, whether he was swimming or it was a painful uh, experience, whether it's pleasant experience. Uh, so going back to give it a full, cir full circle, what you're doing is great work, and we're proud of you as Muslims giving back to the community, and you're giving back to the world. So you're not giving back to a Muslim community, you're serving humanity, which is very important. It started somewhere. So to be inspired, and hopefully others will be inspired, uh, if you can give us, when was that epiphany that you had? I'm very familiar with yours, but uh, you know, the majority of the folks in here don't. But if you can give a uh, you know, short description of the epiphany and how it transformed you to this level that you are in right now, that you're able to serve humanity. Um, we can start with uh, Ahmed to my left and then Ahmed to my right. I'll go slow. I, I try not to say anything in these things you can find on Google. So this like everybody wants to know how the whole price started. It's simple. I, I had went to business school after the fallout of the financial crisis. I was an investment banker. Um, and I, I, you know, I still love the financial markets. And in that room on our first week of class was the CEO uh, of a company called One Laptop Per Child. They make the little green laptops that we're selling for about a hundred and so dollars, 191 actually. Um, but that company broke the market. They were the first real company to say, we're going to sell a product and that product by selling it is going to end poverty through taking on education. And I'm literally sitting in the back, headphones on, it's nonprofit marketing class, you know, and I'm a banker, I don't really care. Um, and then Chuck Kane, which is the name of the, the CEO, he said, you know, uh, the future of this sector, uh, social entrepreneurship. And I, I, you know, raised my hand. I'm like, as a Muslim, you know, you're like zakat, tijada. Like, they're two different, completely things. So I said, I don't, I don't believe you. Like, I don't believe that you can make money servicing the poor. That doesn't make any sense. And he then went on to explain a little bit about what, what I've explained to you today. And I, I sat in class wondering, how could the son of uh, Palestinian immigrants, my father's from Al-Qura in Palestine that didn't have running water, electricity, et cetera. So, I mean, I had for, and we went, I spent three, four months every year in Palestine. So I, I wondered to myself, why is it that I have no idea that this entire sector exists? 
And I'm certain that my other friends, because all of my other iBanking buddies had also gone to business schools around the world, uh, probably had never heard of this sector. And, and there, in that aha moment, was the realization that if more people realized that um, there was an opportunity to, to hybrid social and business and create sustainable models, that surely, if entrepreneurs were chasing the world's biggest challenges, that entrepreneurs would figure it out. So we got started and we invited a few friends to compete in an event that we thought would create startups. And one thing led to another. I got a billionaire and the, probably the world's most powerful man to fall in love. And five years later, we've become uh, what you see today is the whole prize. So that, that was my aha moment. And again, as I said, inside, when I went home that night, I literally, I must have called um, Chuck, uh, who was the CEO at the time, I must have called him a thousand times, literally, because I wanted to meet with him and learn more about the work that they were doing. And it, it became my mission to make sure that other young people around the world also shared in that vision. Thank you. For me, well, I started in healthcare, as I said, and healthcare, I, I think everybody that goes into healthcare has some element within them, some altruistic motive within them, because if they were only interested in making money, there are easier ways. Um, and this doesn't necessarily mean that people do not go to healthcare or go to healthcare only to be altruistic, absolutely not, I'm fully aware of that. But that's one, one aspect. What made the aha moment to me was, I was at Microsoft and I, uh, I was part of a discussion that where Bill Gates was describing his vision for the Gates Foundation and that really made the aha to me. When he was explaining the priorities that uh, the foundation is focusing on, um, I, I was always unhappy with the traditional charitable approach of giving money or giving assistance without the same type of rigor and accountability that I see in the for-profit world. Uh, so when the rigor of accountability was something that I heard from Bill Gates directly, that kind of merged the two worlds to me that, okay, you can do not-for-profit work using the same type of rigor and the same type of accountability and the same type of discipline that the for-profit world follows. In fact, the for-profit world has to follow it, otherwise they'll be out of business. Whereas charities, because they appeal to the good uh, intentions of people, sometimes they get away with, it, with uh, not delivering results for longer than uh, the for-profit world does. So to me, the, the aha moment was hearing Bill Gates's view on, on social entrepreneurship and the accountability associated with it. And I remember one, ex one example from that particular session, he was describing, <clears throat> at that time the foundation was focused mostly on healthcare and less on education. Now, now it's, it's doing both. And his comment was, I'm, I'm not uh, exactly paraphrasing, but it's, uh, or I'm sorry, I'm not quoting directly, uh, I'm paraphrasing. He made a comment that healthcare is more important, it's more basic, it's more essential. First, we, as the foundation, we give people the uh, gift of life through, for example, vaccine, and then someone else will come and educate them. But if they die after one or two, if a child dies after one or two years, then who cares if they get educated? So let's focus more uh, within the foundation. His focus was, okay, let's give them life, and then someone else will educate them. And I guess after they got more with their vaccination programs, which were very effective, then they also turned to education as well. <clears throat> My question is quick. How to basically do what Chuck has done to you, Ahmed, in a large scale? How to undo that myth and this belief that for-profit social entrepreneurship uh, could be done. Because it's a very common, I mean, your uh, sort of mental block that tijara and uh, zakat and tzedakah cannot be mixed, it's a very commonly shared uh, belief. What do you think, where should we go after? Showing the altruism and the holy noble uh, aspects of for-profit social entrepreneurship or veiling all the dirty laundry, so-called non-profit world, their lack of altruism, how corrupt, inefficient, 
and often part of the problem, not part of the solution kind of thing. Yeah, sure, and it's, it's a great point. Um, definitely, look, uh, NGOs uh, and nonprofits are, are needed. I, I don't want to discount their place. Uh, relief work needs to be done by a charity, by a, a traditional charity. But if you want to make progress on the world's toughest social issues, I mean, look at the UN 10-year development goals, which we're just renewing now. Every single one of them has moved backwards, not forward. So we know that uh, the current model, NGO, and its current form is not enough, and, and the leaders of these charities say that charities are not enough. So I think their role, it's not that we want to air their dirty laundry, but we should highlight that a, a new change is needed, and, and we really need to highlight that the existing CEO of a charity who's been giving away money for 30 years can't turn a switch on and become a, a social entrepreneur and begin generating revenues. Those of you that run businesses, you know how hard it is to, to be cash flow positive. Now. Um, to scale, which is the question specifically within the Muslim community, uh, is to do similar things to, to the whole prize. We created the whole prize initially to inspire. And to date, we've had over 100,000 college and university students from the world's top business schools compete in the whole prize firsthand, directly, in five years. And if those of you that know the counts on MBA students, there's only a couple hundred thousand MBA students in the world. Right, so historically we've been able to achieve something I think uh, that, that will impact, and again, as I said, an impact, you don't know if it's gonna be today or in 10 years. So I know for certain all my peers over the last five years know what social entrepreneurship is, know where the divide is. And, and we need more institutions in the Muslim community, whether it be domestically or overseas, to engage in a similar type of model which can do one ultimate goal, which is to give us some, some uh, uh, role models. We need, again, I think Mohammed Ashur, he's a, a Muslim, he's Canadian, he's from McGill. Um, he's gonna do a lot for the Muslim community. His company, Aspire Food Group, will make about $27 million this year, right? Less than 18 months out of uh, winning the whole prize. He's Muslim, we need to celebrate him. Unfortunately, he and I speak all over the world. We're invited to speak at the World Economic Forum, at the UN, uh, here, you know, and different places. Ask me how many times any of the Muslim communities have invited me to speak. The only Muslim place I've been invited and that he's been invited to speak is at MPAC. And that's because Horace and I are good friends, right? It has, and again, I think the whole concept, right, of social entrepreneurship, blending these two, we count on people like you to change the paradigm to be able to have us integrate and tell our stories. Or we can make the choice, which I think that I see we're currently doing, and not embracing this mentality and saying, you know, this may be the things that Dr. Uh, Ahmed and I are talking about are crazy. And that charity is charity and business is business. So again, creating role models uh, is probably the most important thing that we could do as a society and as a community. A couple of very quick comments. First, uh, I agree with Ahmed also that there is always room for charity, like relief work. Uh, like uh, an older lady, 85 years old, doesn't have money and she needs treatment. I mean, the only way to do that is to give her charity. You cannot do social entrepreneurship with her, I, I don't think. Uh, but n nonetheless, regarding your uh, question, Imam, um, the main ideas of social entrepreneurship, I think, are available within the Islamic ethos. For example, the Sadaqa Jariya. Um, it's, it's better to do it on an ongoing basis, and social entrepreneurship is more sustainable than just giving a one-time charity. Um, we, we just need to increase the awareness, and, and, and there are elements that we can build on. Yeah, I think build, building on that, I mean, I used to be in the Islamic banking space, which has not done social entrepreneurship any favors in the U.S., and I think a lot of times, you know, there is a little bit of a fallacy that says, oh, no, this is a scam. But I think if you do go to some of the hadith, there are stories where uh, uh, the Rasul has advised people rather than to beg for money to go collect sticks, sell sticks, and sell those rather than to beg. So I think the stories need to be maybe highlighted more that you know business is the way forward. It's funny, my, my dad and my father-in-law had just finished up last year coming to um, uh, one of our Holt Prize events. And my father-in-law, who was very active in, in D.C., uh, Muslim community, says to me, I, I don't know what the big deal is. He said, um, you guys act like social entrepreneurship is new. 
um, you know, he goes, well, you know, the Quran is, is filled with examples of social entrepreneurship, and you guys are talking about it like you invented it yesterday. So I think it's, it's our responsibility to, um, to highlight some of those things. I'm going to try to speak. I'm sorry. Uh, I have learned to try this. But um, I'd like to congratulate you both for excellent talk. Um, this is probably my aha uh, uh, moment, actually. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, and also, I'd like to thank uh, Café Alafakir to put us in contact with such uh, talented uh, people like uh, both of you. Uh, so we heard from uh, Mr. Ashkar uh, uh, about how you know to do things from business standpoint, uh, basically to run it as a social entrepreneurship uh, programs and from Dr. Hashim, um, where he envisioned that partnership between NGOs and social entrepreneurship, all even for profit, would be the right thing to do. But also, um, you know, by virtue of my uh, involvement with SAMS, uh, I would like to tell you that the way we're looking at this, or what uh, my vision about this is, NGOs probably best run like a business and incorporate and embrace social entrepreneurship as well as business models development and uh, embracing new ideas to implement and use it to develop those communities and be sustainable, provide sustainable resources for the communities. And we would love to have you on board and explore uh, many opportunities. Um, I think it would uh, do a great favor for so many who are in need with such limited resources. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thanks for those Dr. comments. Zabi. So, um, before you clap, I could clap. <laughs> uh, so we're in, in, into the lunchtime, and so I want to thank these guys. They're, they'll be around. Uh, uh, Ahmed is going to be heading out a little bit later in the four afternoon, four. Uh, by 4 o'clock. So, Dr. Zanabli, if you, know, you want to hook up and, and make plans forward, I think that, that'll be great. Uh, one book that I think everybody should read. Uh, Early Islam and the Birth of Capitalism by Benedict Kohler. And you will realize that we know so little about the Prophet's Sirah. What we know is sporadic hadith here and there. And in that book, he explores how the very concept of capitalism is rooted in the very sunnah, the practice of the Prophet, and how he modeled Medinan economics and trade within the uh, market of Medina. He actually set up a free market. And uh, Benedict Kohler, who's an investment banker, he actually explored that, and that book is out now. It just uh, came out this year. So uh, we, a lot of things we have presumptions, and that's what I was trying to highlight earlier, about Islam. Uh, it's not informed through a study of, of these aspects, but it's what we've heard and, and few words and few things like tijara and zakah and so forth. But I think we need to uh, educate ourselves uh, further that a lot of things in the world are not, this is Western and this is Muslim. The, the ecosystem that exists today is a byproduct of cross-sections of civilization. And we were part of that civilization, and if we want to be part of the conversation of civilization of the future, I think we're going to have to embrace that kind of openness and, and study. So that'll be uh, 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 my point on all this. Lunch is now, oh, Professor. Just that in case people don't have access to the book because it, has, it just came out on June 15th, there's a three-page summary of it on the SSRC, which I'm happy to send to you if you wanted to circulate it as a way of further exploring these ideas. Great, thank you. The examples which will be balanced by William a book, Land of Desire, by William Leach, that might put things in perspective on both sides before, you know. I'd love to see one, one of you guys write a book. We read a lot of books in our community. Everybody talks about that book, this book. There's far too few Muslim authors out there. So, again, these are all new ideas. We're Muslims. We should be writing about our own topics. Great. Some people were assigned, and so we're going to take accountability within the cafe team uh, later to make sure that has been done. Uh, things are being recorded, so we, have, we do have access to that. Those who have not registered, please register with Froze. Lunch is now, it finishes at one, at one o'clock. Uh, we're going, those who want to go for a light walk along the trail, meet in front of the uh, building uh, at one, at one o'clock, at one o'clock. And uh, please stick to the itinerary. And then uh, after the walk, there will be uh, obviously the prayers, and then we'll pick that up uh, with the sessions. Thank you.